A note to the listeners, please be advised that episode 91 talks of issues of mental illness, including suicide attempts, and includes some very brief explicit language. Word nerd. Wordsmith. Wordy. Wordless. Oxford Dictionary says a word is a single, distinct, meaningful element of speech or writing, used with others or sometimes alone. We say each one matters. No extra words is literature, minimalist style. And we're getting you right to the story. The Planner by Catherine Moscott The Planner, property of Clarissa Bedingfield. If found, please return to Gavigan, room 206. Please do not read. October, University of Scranton, Pennsylvania. 1. Ask to copy Ashley's English paper. Make up some reason you couldn't do it yourself. 2. Call Devin. Do not let him know anything is wrong. Make plans for the weekend. Hint you'd like to go to Red Robin. 3. Skip study group. Avoid anywhere you might see Matt. 4. Research university code on sexual assault. Realize they can't do shit. 5. Tell Emily about Matt. Do not cry. 6. Borrow money for the morning after pill, which apparently costs 50 freaking dollars. 7. Get Emily to walk you to the pharmacy. 8. Buy the morning after pill. 9. Renew medication. 10. Or don't. 11. Call Nate to wish him good night. November. University of Scranton, Pennsylvania. 1. Ask for extension on history paper. 2. Apologize to Mara for puking in her car. 3. And Ashley for puking on her dress. 4. Meet with lawyer about Matt's hearing. Do not cry. 5. Have Emily drive you to Nate's home to pick up things. 6. Do shots with Emily. No puking this time. 7. Listen to breakup playlist. 8. Secure alcohol for the weekend. 9. Take medication. 10. Or don't. December, New York Presbyterian Hospital. 1. Meet with team of doctors at ridiculously early hour. Discuss release date. 2. Play Uno with other patients. 3. Call Nate. Hope he actually picks up this time. 4. Call lawyer. Ask for news about Matt's hearing. Do not cry. 5. Meet with parents. Tell them what happened. 6. Or don't? 7. Actually take medication. In here, there's not much choice. 8. Or much to do. January. Pearl River, New York, a.k.a. home. 1. Meet with therapist. Remember, it's okay to cry. 2. Meet with DA. 3. Attend River to River Writers Meeting. 4. Fill out medical leave form. 5. Take medication. 6. Actually take it this time. One year later, University of Scranton, Pennsylvania. 1. Write history paper. 2. Tutor Ashley in math. 3. Prepare for court date. 4. Grab dinner with Nate at Red Robin. 5. Get alcohol for the weekend. 6. Or don't. 7. Take medication. 8. Buy new planner. Reading a Letter by J. Franklin Precipitous fall or careful calculation, the tears brushed away to almost give the appearance of normality, to pretend that water falling on a rock never wears it away. Another tear slides down the slope of the face and lands on a piece of paper. The blue ink blurs and runs to the fringes, red plumes interspersed along the way. Stiff black ink dissolves into yellow and orange and blue in veins along the paper. The ink bleeds through. I always thought it was odd to say that ink, the substance of a paper, bleeds. A piece of paper is a peculiar thing. 
Stab it, and it still has some semblance of what it was. Cut into a thousand pieces, and it can still be pieced together again. Crush it, walk all over it, and it's all right. But it will crumble in the rain, and it will bleed from tears. The paper sits there, a thing of held breath, secrets locked in ink. And with a drop of water, the facade fades away, and we can see the careful mesh that holds it all together. With just a drop of water, a canvas presents itself, and we see what it is made of. Held breath. Anxiety as a buffer between a cool face and blazing feeling. Water droplets dancing on a scalding plate to keep from drowning in air. Hello there! Welcome to No Extra Words, the flash fiction podcast. My name is Chris Baker Dersh. I'm your producer and editor. This was an interesting episode to put together, and it is a tough one. It's heavy, which I want to apologize for, but I don't want to apologize for these works of fiction because I think they speak to an important part of our world and part of our human existence. But it is difficult to do. We've done episodes that have walked around the edges of mental illness before, um, and that's been well received and we've had some beautiful pieces of fiction written. This one is deep. It, there's a couple of hospitalizations and, and suicide attempts in today's episode. And that's part of the messy experience of humanity, unfortunately. And I thought of a lot of different titles for this episode trying to think of something that covers this idea of beauty in the broken. And as as I'm recording this right now, I honestly don't know exactly what I am going to call it. I think the title may actually come out of the little chat I'm going to have with you guys. The first story that I placed in this episode actually is still forthcoming. It's a piece by A.E. Harrison on mental illness, hospitalization, and suicide. And when she submitted it, she actually first approached me with a comment on our No Actual Words Facebook page, just asking, do you take submissions of stories on very dark, I don't remember exactly how she worded it, but heavy topics? And I said, yeah, absolutely. Um, We might do a little bit of an upfront warning to people that that's coming. But yes, we are not afraid to tackle the deep here on No Extra Words. And so once that piece arrived... Figuring out how to build around it was interesting. And then Catherine Moskett sent her piece, which was marvelous. And I really didn't want to make this the suicide attempt episode (laughs) um, in any way. And so trying to think of what to scaffold around those two central pieces. And the others that are on the show, reading a letter, I just loved because it was the act of tears and the act of crying, but described sort of almost from the perspective of an inanimate object. You know, we're almost seeing these tears from the paper's point of view, which I think is really interesting, especially when paired up right alongside the planner. And then we're closing with a piece by No Actual Words regular contributor T.E. Cowell on the beginnings of of mental illness and, and the struggles of being human, I think. And then right smack in the middle, one thing that I've been doing this year is doing a segment. And this segment is a nonfiction break. Every now and then we step away from our fiction world and we do a little bit of flash nonfiction. And there's a beautiful piece, a man describing death in nature and what that looks like. That's going to kick off the second half of the show before we get to A.E. Harrison's story. And we're going to close with T.E. Cowell's story. One brief announcement, and I think this is a good announcement to follow Catherine Moskett's story. We are still looking for stories. You still have a couple weeks left to submit your fiction, nonfiction, and poetry all about women's health and choice. More information on that is over at noextrawords.wordpress.com. All I will say right here is we are not looking to do an exclusively abortion episode. Choice and women's health are big issues in the lives of all women and encompasses everything from, like you heard in the last story, sexual assault and, you know, emergency contraception and access 
were some issues that were brought into that story, um, as well as fertility, aging, menopause, any and all kinds of stories about women's health. And that deadline is looming. I, I would love to get those by Friday, October 20th, so we can start to put that episode together. If you don't have a piece yourself, but you have a network of writer friends or acquaintances or folks who might, please feel free to pass along and share that. In October, have more short fiction for you. I'm also going to be bringing you my personal writer's journey as I prepare for National Novel Writing Month. So stay tuned for that. And I'm going to dive you back into the deep. You're going to slide in gently with your piece of nonfiction coming up. And then we're going to close with stories by A.E. Harrison and T.E. Cowell. And I will see you next time here on No Extra Words. This is your nonfiction break. Death of a Luna Moth by Paul Rousseau. It, I named her Marla, was there in the morning by the door on the front porch, after a long night of rain. Rain that at times was dense and torrential. Large, at least by moth size, Marla was a beautiful light green, almost a lime green, with four circular markings on her wings. The front porch seemed a place of rest and refuge from the rainfall, a chilly yet dry sanctuary that offered her not only comfort, but the chance for another day. In the early morning hours the following day, Marla's wings were spread wide, open to the day, her majesty on full display, clinging proudly and beautifully to the door frame. She remained unmoved throughout the day, as if in suspended animation, which she might have been, conserving energy, for the luna moth does not eat or drink, waiting for the evening darkness, hoping to find a mate to ensure propagation of the species. But as evening descended, Marla was still there. As she was the next morning, her wings folded in, her body appearing to disintegrate, a seemingly slow-motion collapse of life, alone in this small space, in the middle of a mirror-like woodlands, except for me, an observer of her death, the death of a moth. I wonder if Marla knew she was dying, if there was an intrinsic awareness of impending death, or was there an unknowing and insentient withering of the will to live and to survive, the promised intransience of all things living, or had Marla simply brought a moment of beauty to a sad world, and knew that now, in these few days, and in these few moments, it was time to leave? No Failed Stars by A. E. Harrison The intravenous fluid's purpose was to erase all traces of alcohol from her system. She rolled the silver contraption with the bagged fluid to the window. After a week she barely remembered, she began to feel entombed in the hospital room. Fortunately, she was not in the center of the ward and had a window that faced an empty pasture behind the relatively new hospital. Instead of an empty courtyard, she faced the outskirts of the town, which had begun to balloon around its edges. Subdivisions and the beginning of strip mall skeletons punctured a once rural landscape. Because the window faced away from streetlights, she could watch Venus, the pearl in the westward sky, grow heavy with sleep and slip toward the soft, dark blanket of the horizon. How is it that I failed a third time? She whispered to no one in particular. The nurses only came in dribbles now. No seizure checks. She had not tried to leave. She had not gotten anyone to smuggle in any beverage with a proof into the room. She was still, regrettably, despite her valiant, epic effort, irrevocably here and breathing. She rubbed her ribs and smiled. Those paramedics took their jobs seriously. Three times. I really suck at this, she chuckled. If you cannot successfully commit suicide after three attempts, you had better come up with alternate plans. 
After awaking from a two-day unconsciousness vacation, she had been rabidly angry, grabbing at the tubes and bedsheets, biting and fighting to leave. She was all teeth and claws until they sent Attila the nurse. A mountainous woman with a mass of curly hair, Attila promptly sat on her until she acquiesced between gasps to remain in the hospital bed. Two hours later, she had her final seizure. An hour after that, they pronounced that her pancreas, liver, and her left kidney were making a comeback. Fairly good for a child that flatlined three times, Attila said, squeezing her hand. She reluctantly nodded. She had called no one. Not family, not friends. No need to let them know their statue had fallen off the pedestal. That the beautiful Baroque painting was simply a dressed-up cheap motel decoration. They had placed her in the psychiatric ward where they placed all people who were going through delirium tremens for observation and testing. I thought you said all the organs were pumping, she asked. Not that type of testing, sweet pea, Attila said, punctuated by a smile that was more of a wince. Forty-eight hours ago, a young man whisked into her room. At first, his questions were oddly convivial, as if they were passing time until the tea kettle boiled. Sometime among the discussion of her collegiate academics and her family, he bit the tip of his chubby black pen and said, "'Tell me everything bad that has happened to you thus far.' Shrugging, she chronicled what she could, not sure how these episodic trials were important to the bottles of alcohol she drank. After an hour, the young man had the appearance of a goldfish out of water, blue eyes bulging, and the pen jotting frantic notes in the most horrific handwriting. "'I will return tomorrow. We are doing further testing.' This was a test? Must have been a pop quiz, she half-heartedly joked. He returned and asked her a litany of questions. Three hours of head-nodding memory tests and what does this picture look like questions shot at her with little rest. After the Inquisition, he examined his watch, smiled, and said, I will be back soon. Rounds. When he returned, he uttered two words. In two little words and the squeeze of her hand, the hindsight of her life came into sharp focus clear and tangible for the first time. Bitter tears rolled down her thin face. It's not a death sentence, he whispered. I know, but it has a name. The monster under the bed has a name. The doctor smiled and left her alone with her thoughts. She stared at the stars through her window. Attila, with her crisp white shirt and benevolently brown face, said that she would have to find something to hold on to in the dark hours when the monster rose and clouded her world. She watched the stars, gaseous winking. They were a distant obsession since she was a child. She stalked them like intergalactic prey. Specks of rumbling light going through their life, some dying, some being born, all going through explosively brilliant changes, their celestial cloudy spheres ebbing and flowing. The cataclysmic theatrical finale of a supernova, the potential for neutron stars, the beacons of pulsars and gamma rays and galaxies whirling nervously around black holes caused a brief flutter of giddiness in her belly. The stars that would explode into pieces of mineral that would make life. Her life. She, like everyone here, was an intricate map of the remnants of stars. And suddenly a lump swelled in her throat. Stars lived their lives, growing valiantly until the end never giving up their brilliance, and then at the end they shattered into pieces that spread across the universe. It simply lived, and in its death gave the universe its finely breathless burnout, sending dust to make significantly insignificant humans. No star wanted to be a moon. They didn't shed unnecessary tears about not being a planet or a comet. They were lived their life perfectly, trembling through mighty and dying, but never regretting what they were and their delicate place in the world. She smiled and returned to her bed, holding on to the idea that her parts, broken, beaten, and bloody, were made of stars, and there were no such thing as failed stars. How It Starts by T.E. Cowell I haven't been outside once today. I've looked out the windows plenty of times, but that's as close as I've gotten. Now it's getting dark out. 
dark and cold. No way am I going outside now. If I was to go outside today, I would have done it by now. I've missed my chance. This is the first day of my life, I'm fairly certain, that I haven't gone outside. Every day before this, I'm fairly certain that I've been outside, if only for a minute or two. When I was younger, I was always outside, was outside more than I was inside. I rode bikes, played hide-and-go-seek tag with my brothers and friends, played soccer, basketball, baseball, ping-pong. As I got older, though I was outside a little less, I still made a habit of being outside for at least part of the day. I went on a lot of solitary walks. Walking's been my go-to outside activity for years now. I could have taken a walk today, but I didn't. I just didn't feel like it. I was tired, more so than usual. So tired that I felt like staying inside. So I did just that. I did laundry, cooked, read, thought, worried. One thing I worried about was the fact that I hadn't been outside yet today. I worried about what this meant. This was around 3 or 3.30 in the afternoon when the sun was already well into its descent. I could have gone out for a short walk around this time, but I didn't. Now, as I've said, it's getting dark out. Dark and cold. I look out the windows at the steadily darkening darkness and think, so this is how it starts. Thanks for listening to the No Extra Words podcast. For more information about today's stories and contributors, or to learn how to submit your own work, please visit us at noextrawords.wordpress.com. If you would like to support the show, please tell a few friends about us, or you can visit patreon.com slash noextrawords to pledge your financial support. See you next time.